Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, Reed Fischler, and Jonathan Wentz. On this episode of DTNS, scientists create a real-life dune still suit, Amazon launches a new assistant in shopping called Rufus, and Michael Wolf joins us to talk about how chatbots and more are changing the food industry. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 12th. Happy birthday, Eileen Rivera, 2024. In Los happy Angeles, birthday. I'm Tom Merritt. Sorry, I was so excited to say happy birthday to Eileen. <laughs> uh, from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. Happy birthday, Eileen. Drawing the top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And founder of The Spoon and host of The Spoon Podcast, Michael Wolf is back with us. Welcome back, Michael. It's been too long. Dialing in from Seattle. Hey, how's how's the uh, Seattle overcast skies? Not bad. We haven't got the heat that you guys have, I think. That's nice. In, yeah. In LA. Actually, I uh, am jealous. L.A. has not been as bad as it has been elsewhere in the Southwest, as, as hot as it has been. Uh, it's It's been real bad over there in Las Vegas and Phoenix and, and places like that. So um, g- glad you're out of the heat as well. Uh, we've got great topics to talk about. Let's start with the quick hits. While the growth of EV sales is flattening, it's still growing. Market research firm Rowmotion says that global EV sales rose 13% year over year in June. The rise was driven mostly by a 25% increase in sales in China. But sales for EVs fell in Europe by 7% after the imposition of a 37.6% tariff on Chinese EV imports. U.S. and Canadian EV sales were up 6%. AT&T is notifying about 110 million customers that criminals have accessed phone records for nearly all of them, uh, including landline and cell phone customers. The records that were accessed included your phone number, uh, records of which number that phone number called or sent text messages to between May 1st, 2022 and October 31st, 2022. Uh, the records do not include time or date, just what numbers called what. It also doesn't include the content of the calls or the messages. AT&T doesn't include that stuff. Uh, it also does include non-AT&T numbers. It kind of makes sense if you think about it. If if you had an AT&T number and you called somebody who was T-Mobile, well, that's going to be in the log. Uh, it also sometimes has the cell site ID, which could be used to determine the approximate location of the call. The breach is yet another one caused by attackers accessing data through compromised Snowflake accounts. If you recall, Snowflake is a data analysis firm, and they say some of their clients were not using multi-factor authentication to access their Snowflake accounts, leading to the breaches. The EU has issued yet another preliminary finding that X's verification marks, those are the blue check marks that you see on some accounts, appear to violate the Digital Services Act. The EU says the system doesn't properly verify users. And because of that, it's deceptive to users who think that that blue check mark equals identity verification. X allows anybody who pays to get a verification check mark, but does do some verification along with it. The EU says it has found examples of malicious actors gaming the system. The EU also accused X of violating data transparency rules. X now has a chance to respond to the findings. Back in 2018, Bleeping Computer and a few others noted that Signal's desktop app stored the encryption key for the local database in plain text on the desktop. Now, Signal responded that it provides end-to-end encryption, not at rest encryption. They're saying this, we never promised you it would be encrypted on the desktop. Uh, neither it nor any app can really truly protect a user's data at rest if the machine has been compromised. But recently, both Elon Musk and mobile security researchers Talal Haj Bakri and Tommy Misk of Misk Incorporated raised the issue, even though it's a few years old, and described it as a vulnerability. Now, Signal maintains it is not a vulnerability, but after all of the back and forth about it, has decided to adopt independent researcher Tom Plant's mitigation that is to use Electron's Safe Storage API. And what that's going to do is use platform APIs to store the key instead of plain text. So DP API on Windows, uh, KWallet on Linux, Keychain on Mac OS. Uh, Those are not perfect either because, you know, if somebody has access to your computer, you've got bigger problems and they could be able to access that as well. Uh, But at least it's not a key stored in plain text. 
The European Union's AI Act goes into effect on August 1st. Its provisions will phase in over the next two years, with everything in effect by mid-2026. The act categorizes developers by the riskiness of what they're creating. So low-risk uses have almost no regulations. High-risk uses are basically prohibited. This includes using models or algorithms for credit scoring, facial recognition databases, remote biometrics for law enforcement, except within certain exceptions, risky uses that are not prohibited, like employment, education, and critical infrastructure, still have strict data quality and anti-bias requirements. All developers face new transparency requirements as well. All right. Who's a fan of Dune? Michael, you seen Dune? You read Dune? You a fan of Dune? Yeah, the new one, not the old one. Now, the new one, not, but you know about yeah, the still yeah. suits, right? The yeah. the things that the Fremen wear that that means they they collect almost all of their perspiration and any other uh, excretions yep. to to save water. Uh, well, scientists at Cornell University have created a prototype spacesuit for astronauts that will recycle urine into drinkable water during spacewalks. It's not nearly as disgusting as it might sound to some of you. Uh, The International Space Station already does this. In fact, I didn't realize how efficient they are at it. The ISS recycles 98% of the water used on board. Uh, Some of the 2% it can't recycle is when astronauts go on longer spacewalks. Uh, They have to wear on a spacewalk a maximum absorbency garment, a mag AKA a diaper, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, yeah. you're peeing in your suits. Because you can't pop into the ISS and yep. you know t- take a leak. Yeah, uh, I mean, when, yeah. What yeah. else are you gonna do? So, so they they have to have that, and they have to carry their own drinking water, uh, a liter of drinking water in what is called an in-suit drinking bag, an mm. IDB. Uh, so Cornell developed a, re- a system that replaces the mag with a UCD. UCD stands for urine collection device. Uh, you wear the system as an eight kilogram backpack. And what happens is uh, there are multiple layers of flexible fabric connected to a molded silicone cup lined with polyester microfiber. And that will draw the fluid away from your lower parts in your body. Uh, A vacuum pump then pulls it into a filtration system that uses forward and reverse osmosis to remove contaminants. They say they can do it with 87% efficiency, which qualifies it to be potable water, water you can drink. Uh, And then as it's going into the drinking bag, uh, powder is added to it to restore electrolytes to the water uh, so that it'll be, you know, fully nutritious water. Yeah, there's uh, and vitamins in there. Yeah, there's magnesium and phosphorus, uh, potassium, all that stuff. You know, Gatorade. Um, stuff you get in hard water. You know, stuff you get when you're drinking regular water. That goes into the IDB so they don't have to carry as much water with them because they're going to be replenishing it. Uh, and they say this thing can process 500 milliliters. That's about two cups in five minutes. So it's pretty darn efficient. They've also already tried it. Uh, they, the system works on Earth. So the next step is to try it in microgravity and make sure it works when there isn't a lot of gravity. Amazing. Who's ready to try it? I mean, you know, original- you know how I feel about space. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, meaning I mean, I'm never going. But Michael, maybe you would like, you know, wh- what do you think about this? I mean, going back to the original space race with the Soviet Union and the U.S., they... Uh, started technology that would take essentially take carbon dioxide and turn it into proteins. And so those technologies that started back 40 years ago, actually there's a couple startups using that same technology. So I'm not surprised they're taking this technology, taking our, our pee and making it into, into drinkable water. Cause it's the most challenging environment possible is in space. And so as we look towards long-term space travel, we're going to have to do everything we can. Yeah, that was one of the uh, driving factors behind this is they are uh, planning to return people to the surface of the moon with the Artemis missions. And when you're out walking around on the moon, uh, you're you're definitely going to need to carry water with you. You're going to need to be able to pee in your suit. Uh, And so this is going to be useful for that as well. This is not the first thing to be called a still suit. Uh, Ars Technica pointed out that Hacksmith Industries did a one-day build of one uh, last month, but theirs uh, was more of a waterproof baggy suit, uh, and it wasn't quite as efficient 
uh, as the one, and it, and it took a while. It wasn't able to get much uh, of the water reclaimed. Apparently, the one from Cornell is is a lot more efficient and a lot more practical, and it's meant to go into space. And I, I also I, I feel for anybody who's listening to the story being like, ew, it's pee though. No, uh, water treatment plants in <laughs> municipal uh, water areas in many cities um, do a lot of the same thing that this is doing. Uh, you know, when when y- you know. Y- you need to know where your water is coming from. Tap water can be a little bit different depending on where you live, but in many places, myself included, I mean, I use tap water to cook dinner kind of thing. That water was not real clean at one point, but it has become more clean because we have uh, reasons to make it clean and and recycle it uh, to, you know, give the water back to people who need water. We need water. So I think I think the takeaway I got from this is, yeah, we need water in space and anything that can help and is going not going to hurt the person that's, you know, using this method is great. Yeah, there's no new water. All the <laughs> all the water <laughs> yeah. we have uh, is usually, yeah. you know, we, refiltered we, somehow. We, maybe we a spring did from. it. Yeah, right. Maybe maybe <laughs> it was like... done at a city plant. But, you know, and yeah, I get it. Uh, usually you don't see it getting filtered. It's on a longer life cycle than like in your own suit. But uh, but yeah, this is this is super practical. And, and uh, if it's doing its job, it's it's filtering it well enough that you would not even yeah. notice if you didn't know otherwise. There's a deep space food challenge that the NASA and the Canadian Space Agency have been doing for the past three years. And like hundreds of companies have entered. One of them, a couple of them have basically been doing similar things. One of them actually, I think, takes fecal matter and uses it for fuel to grow food. So, ah, uh-huh. I, I, yeah, yeah. So, there, and I don't think yeah. that was one of the final. The Martian though, but, good movie. <laughs> yeah. 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 Worked yeah. for him no. too. Yeah. You've, you've got to filter that stuff out well too because yep. it can it can cause problems but there's a lot of nutrients in there for yep. plants there so is. yeah there is. what do you think fertilizer is made of y'all yeah so anyway uh i uh, part of me was like well it's weird to have michael on to talk about food and start <laughs> start with this story but but it kind of fits right it's actually perfect it? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, on a bit of a different note, Amazon's shopping assistant chatbot called Rufus, which you may have been testing, uh, but if you haven't heard about it before, is now live for all U.S. customers in the Amazon mobile app. You can access Rufus from the bottom right of the main navigation bar. It's like the little hamburger menu that's in the bottom right. It can help with things like product comparisons, search, recommendations. Rufus is powered by one of Amazon's own uh, LLMs, large language models, uh, tuned for shopping specifically and trained on Amazon's own product catalog, which obviously is very large, customer reviews, Q&As, and some public information found on the web. I tried this out this morning. Um, I did, uh, I, I, I have uh, the Amazon shopping app, at least for iOS is, is where you can find Rufus. And I did have to restart my phone and, uh, and kind of rejigger a couple of things, but it did eventually show up and I'm in the market for new bath towels. So I was like, okay, this is, this can be kind of a fun, uh, experiment. You know, I, you know, show me some gray towels and it did. And I was like, are there other colors of the towels that you also uh, recommend these gray towels in? Yes, got that. Um, are the gray towels very plushy? Would you like to see some plushy towels? It worked really well for this specific situation. Then nice. I was all excited, and I went over to my Amazon Echo Show, which is in the kitchen, and you know tried to load Rufus. Now it's only it's only in the app itself. Um, it's not on Echo devices as of now, but it does. I was complaining about this, I think, just a couple weeks ago on DTNS that I wish there was just more context that I could use Amazon's assistant, you know, the A word for, Um, you know, she's good for certain things, but not great for contextual questions. And I think Rufus is getting us to a a similar place. Of course, you have to kind of know what you're looking for. um, To start with, but if you do, as I did this morning. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, I it feels I, like I, it feels like Alexa has been aging, and so I'm I'm excited to see if this can maybe add more contextual smartness. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to step on you there. No, no, no. Uh, likewise, I didn't mean to step on you either. Uh, that's a problem I have with no my one wants smart to step assistants on quite else. often too. Yeah, we're all friends in our spacesuits. 
I do. Uh, I do really. Uh, I do like the idea of this. I think it's interesting that they branded it Rufus, and not just their other voice assistant that I won't say and, and set it <laughs> off. Uh, you know, this this sort of blends into what we're going to be talking to you about in a minute, Michael, which is uh, trying to get ahead of your customers using these kinds of tools on their own, right? So somebody may go to ChatGPT or Claude or somebody and say, hey, I, I need a gray towel advice. Amazon's trying to say, hey, cut out the middle band. Don't ask them and then come to us. Ask ours. It's it's trained on our product catalog. It should be better. Yeah, absolutely agree. I think we're all starting to see these new types of chatbots that are oriented around specific use cases. Obviously, Amazon's going to be around, sh gonna be around sh shopping, but we're starting to see ones like Gatorade put out a hydration coach that is helping you to basically stay hydrated. So I think and now that- <laughs> When's the that last time you had Gatorade? Yeah. Yeah. Time for another. It, it tells you to drink more Gatorade. <laughs> but no surprise, shocker, drink more Gatorade. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that this is a better example of how to use this sort of thing. ChatGPT is a try to do everything tool. And I, I've said multiple times on this show that it's not going to be great at everything you throw at it. It's going to be really good at some things and really bad at others. Uh, and the things it's really bad on are going to make headlines, uh, especially at the more clickbaity outlets out there. Uh, whereas something that's more tailored like this is going to be better at what it does. On the other hand, uh, some of the reviews I, I saw said it still doesn't get everything right, even as as narrow as it was. I tried it. I tried it for uh, dog stuff, uh, and and it really just didn't understand what I wanted. I was like, I need, I need a mat to go at the bottom of a dog playpen, uh, and it gave me a plushy, you know, dog beds. And I'm like, no, no, no. I need a not. I need a chew proof one. You know, one that's a claw proof, chew proof. Yeah. It gave me a bunch of plushy ones. Like, and and I've looked for these on my own, so I know they're out there. It just couldn't quite understand what I was. What yeah, I, was I mean, for. we're still in the in in the the era of like the query is important. How you yeah. how you tell the thing, you know, what you want. Uh, in this example, Rufus, I I think I got lucky because I was like. Show me gray towels. Yeah, it's pretty show, mainstream. Yeah, show me like the nicest gray towels on the market. I mean, whether I'm going to buy them or not, you know, let, let's have some fun here. Show me the, I like I like this model. Show me these in different colors. It was pretty good. It was pretty yeah. good. I was I was impressed. But that was, I mean, I wasn't throwing a real curveball at the system. Um, but I think that uh, if you're using Amazon shopping app on a regular basis, it's certainly worth trying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's, and it's it's no different than the algorithmic like if you're interested in this you might also like, you know, as far as conflict of interest or whatever, it's still yeah. still Amazon telling you it. Um but it's you know, like you said, it's supposedly trained on actual customer opinions, so maybe it'll be a little better at those. Does it seem in your face cuz I notice like on LinkedIn for example, I feel like they're just trying to shove their AI assistant into my face every time I use it same with facebook with their meta ai it, yeah does it seem like it's a natural it's not, pretty much subtle. not yeah it's down okay. there on the bottom right yeah. it's just a little little icon okay you kind of have to know it's there and then you tap it and it's like oh yeah i can help you out well there that was just get, the, this morning before i had restarted my phone i was like i don't see it i don't <laughs> Where is it? I don't know where this is. You know, I was clicking around everywhere. Then it was it was obvious, but still, yeah. I mean, it's 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 buried in a menu. It's not like the kind of thing that if you launch the app, it's like you got to talk to Rufus now. Yeah. That's you know, that's your new normal kind of <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. No, not even, at all. I even mean, Bank maybe, of America. Maybe is that, that way will happen theirs. at some point. But. Yeah. Give it yeah. time. It's Amazon. They'll make it yeah. pushy. No, yeah. good point. Yeah. As soon Don't as they, do, as soon Don't as that pushy. first review of usage comes through a meeting, they'll uh, they'll figure out ways to stick it in front of you. Uh, but talking to our computers is a time honored science fiction trope, right? Uh, hello, computer from Star Trek IV. Uh, we decided to count down the top five things that were inspired by science fiction, actual tech that you can use today that was inspired by science fiction. So if you'd like to see what we think are the top five, go catch that right now at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, at DTNS Picks, DTNS P-I-X on Instagram, and of course, youtube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. So we talk a lot about generative models on this show, how they affect 
art, media, software development, programming, customer service. Uh, today, let's see how they're being used in the food business. Michael, you gave a keynote at the Fancy Food Show in New York City not that long ago. Uh, this landscape keeps evolving. These kinds of tools can help in supply chains, but will also be used by customers, as we just discussed, like in, on Amazon. What's the first thing people should know about how these tools are going to change how we buy and sell food? Well, if you're a food producer, I think you got to realize that the consumer behavior is going to change very rapidly. Um, I think tools like Alexa's new tool, uh, I was talking about another one. There's a company call, out there called January AI that allows you to simply take a picture of a food and it'll predict what the impact of that food will be on your blood sugar. So imagine all oh, these wow. tools in the hands of consumers. They're going to change the way they behave. Secondly, if you're a food producer, uh, just the, the speed at which you can change and adapt new types of food is accelerating. There's, you know, originally it took like impossible foods, like three years to, to develop their secret sauce, that heme that allows plant-based ingredients to taste like meat. These types of tools, AI is allowing companies to do this in like a month to two months now. So it's just the speed at which new types of food is being developed is accelerating very quickly. That seems similar to a lot of the things I've read about science where, you know, protein folding, for example, can be yeah. accelerated because you can you can have the computer just crunch through a bunch of them using these these generative models uh, much faster mm -hmm. than you would be able to do it, even even with a model that was cranking through it. Um, that that is fascinating that, you know. Uh, they could come up with brand new types of food, right? Uh, that that we haven't seen before. Do you do you know of any examples like that? Well, I mean, if you, it starts back with remember um, IBM's Watson, they came up with Chef Watson. That whole idea was let's map digitally map the food, the different flavors, the taste notes, etc. And then back then, ten years ago, they're trying to find novel combinations, new recipes. Now that's moved a lot farther beyond that. So they are just they have this greater understanding of food. They understand the different building blocks. And because there's computers that understand this, AI can search for new and novel ways to make recipes or flavors or ingredient mm -hmm. maps. Yeah. So. Can, can it uh, tie into trends too, you know, and kind of keep an eye on TikTok and be like, oh, everybody's into cottage cheese. You know, let's, let's come up with some cottage cheese related products to put out there. Yeah. Not only that, they can actually do much more predictive, better understanding of what consumer preferences will be. Uh, I was just talking to a company that's whole idea is they're making essentially uh, simulated data around consumer trends. They could take a pretty small amount of data around, say, a different ethnic group or a different demographic age group, put that into AI models and predict how they might like a new form of chips or a new form of Gatorade, for example. So those types of things, which may take surveys in the past, you have to go out and survey a bunch of people, do focus groups. They're using AI to predict how this food might do if they introduced it. What about the actual tools we use uh, to make food? Uh, you know, a lot of what we, we think of when we think of these models is going into guiding robotics and things like mm -hmm. that. Are you seeing, seeing much uh, momentum in that area? Well, AI and, and robotics has a huge overlap on a Venn diagram, and there's just a whole bunch of startups building food robotics. Much of those are going into restaurants and food production facilities. Very few is actually going into the home. I know that we talk about the consumer robot that will cook us food. Um, there's a bunch of startups trying to do that, but no one's really hit it out of the park yet. So um, there's definitely a lot of advancements over the past decade in computer vision, that's actually leading to real advancements in things like food waste reduction. IKEA in the UK, for example, has reduced their amount of food waste in their in-house restaurants by tons because they're able to monitor more closely using computer vision what's going on in terms of their kitchens and how what type of food they're using. How does that play out? They just they just know better how much they're using or whether it's going to go bad soon or what? Well, it's, there's a couple startups doing this. They actually just put a, a camera above the food waste uh -huh. bin and then they can monitor. And there's a, there's actually also a, a scale. It can show you what they're, you're throwing out in terms of okay. extra scraps. It could weigh that. And then it says it'll come out in a dashboard and tell the chef or the food purchaser, you bought too much onions last week. Gotcha. Don't buy as many Swedish meatballs next <laughs> week. So Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and kind of, I, I assume it can match that with sales trends and everything and say, Oh, and we sell this many meatballs. You, you don't need to order this much onion or whatever. That, or that makes this, perfect sense. This thing that was, you know, kind of expensive last week is on sale. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, yeah, you know, 
change a recipe. Yeah, and, you know, and factor in contextual information like holidays coming up or what the foot traffic was like last week. And that would just predict basically what you're going to want to order the next week or the next week after that. That's a really interesting thought is pricing. Uh, how much uh, are you seeing of, of companies trying to help restaurants keep costs down, help consumers keep costs down when it comes to food? Yeah, I think one of the places we've seen a lot of advancement in terms of AI is in basically supply chain, ordering raw inputs, et cetera. That type of thing, because it's SaaS, has moved a lot further than, for example, let's use a, an AI to develop a next generation food product. So I think that's a more mature area, and it's like an area that uh, we're seeing a lot of big food companies use because, as you, you've talked about, like there's an uh, – inflation is a real problem. Big CPG brands are struggling with that, and so they're trying to optimize their supply chains using AI. Yeah. Now, it, it, it sounds like we're probably not going to get the robot chef in our own homes anyway anytime soon. But uh, what about – something I've wanted for a long time is maybe some computer vision in my fridge – uh, and my cabinets, my pantry that knows what I have. And I can just say, give me some recipes. Give me some things I can make with what I have. Well, and some smart fridges are already promising that. Yeah, the latest generation Samsung Family Hub actually has an advanced camera in it that actually looks at what you have. And then it will use generative AI to whip up a recipe. Um, I think a lot of it's going to just be driven to help you maybe add more things to your shopping basket. Yeah, <laughs> um, because all these guys are trying to monetize for these extra things. But yeah, the, yeah. the smart fridges are getting better. But you haven't seen a ton of consumers embrace them because people haven't really shown that they want cameras in the fridge. I know yeah. you do, Tom, but I think a lot of people don't. Well, and the ones I've seen, you know, at CES and elsewhere, just just haven't been quite as good at it as I want them to be. You know, I I want it to be real dead simple. Of like this this thing is locally stored. It knows everything I have, and it can give me some recipe ideas based on that. Uh, that's the one that I saw from Samsung. It was like it knew some of the ingredients, but not all of them. And so I I had to provide some of it as well. Uh, I'm just being too much of a perfectionist. I know. Yeah. Well, I, I think the... you know, as uh, you know, somebody who's uh, only rented apartments ever, um, I think that that's also a barrier to entry for a lot of people. It's like, I give me the AI fridge, <laughs> but I can't pay for that. <laughs> that's my landlord, and he's not doing it either. Uh, you know, we kind of we we deal with what we deal with. And so we end up having, you know, smaller little devices that that we use for this kind of stuff. It's a lot to Amazon, ask Amazon you know, for had somebody a patent. to, you know, buy like a yeah. smart washer dryer. Amazon had a patent, I think, three years ago that where they had an electronic nose that would basically detect when your mm -hmm. produce was expiring because all produce emits gas. And so I think and there's been a couple startups trying to do that essentially the next generation food storage bin. So I think that would be interesting to watch if that ever comes around. Rufus in your fridge. <laughs> Rufus in your fridge. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, it's time time to uh, buy more green onions and throw those ones out because they're gone. They're slimy. Although you uh, could just look at them and know. I suppose that's always true of everything, right? There's <laughs> yeah, always an know, older way to do it. Yeah. You can always go analog, everybody. You know, yeah. look at those green onions. Why are they're you listening bad. to MP3s when you can just put an LP on? Come on. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Who needs these f fancy fandangled <laughs> streaming services anyway? Well, you know? one human that I like uh, that I will never replace with AI is Len Peralta, who has been busy drawing our topics today. Uh, Len, what have you drawn for us? You know, before I show today's art, I just want to preface that I know this is not how AI is going to be used in the food business. It's just sort of a fun little mashup. But you know, the question I ask is, what should you know about AI in the food business? The answer is, uh, among other things, hands will still be an issue <laughs> on new products, you know. Uh, and this product here is called Plant Taints, which, uh, you know, Ooh, it isn't. Are they tainted plantains? <laughs> yeah. They just, they ain't plantains. Ooh, yeah. They're, but they're yeah. also tainted with those plantains. fingers. Plantains, yeah. exactly. they're difficult anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah you so, know you know, I, actually doing. it's fascinating what AI can do. It's it's going to be very interesting to see how it goes on. But let's let's figure out the hands thing first, if we can. I don't know. Um, um, if you are interested in this image, it is at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. Back me at the DTNS lover level and you get this immediately or go to the old-fashioned way to my online store, lenperaltastore.com, where you can just purchase it and put it up and remind you that AI still has some issues to work out before we can really trust it. So, there you go. 
Good stuff as always, Len. Michael Wolf, also such a pleasure to have you on with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, it was a blast. As always, just find me at The Spoon. Google it. We're always the first result. We have a podcast called The Spoon Podcast. Fantastic. Go check it out, folks. Thespoon.tech. Uh, and patrons, you're not done yet. Uh, we got more show for you. Stick around. It's Friday. We always like to do something fun on Friday. And Roger has prepared a food tech quiz. Some of it's just food, too, but it's all fun. And who doesn't like to talk about food? So how much do we know about food? Play along and find out. <laughs> you can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Back on Monday with Shannon Morse joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer Joe Kuntz. Producer at large Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods. Beatmaster W. Scottis One. BioCow. Captain Kipper. Steve Guadarrama. Paul Reese. Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso and JD Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Our contributors for this week's shows included Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, Chris Christensen, and Justin Robert Young. Our guests this week were Juan Tue Dao and Michael Wolf. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>